Uh, I mean, this, this cultured, fine, refined stuff, I'm just kind of out of place, you know. Like a fellow said one time, he said, Ruckman's got early American features. He looks like a buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I, told a, I told a guy one time, I said, I got, I got finely chiseled features, but the chisel slipped. <laughs> now, uh, you, take, uh, you take tonight, uh, I've given you a little, bit of, a little bit of honey now and some other things, and it's time to get some strong meat tonight. So we'll get our Bibles, and we'll go down deep and heavy tonight. And some of you come up dripping wet and madder on a wet hen. And we're going to step on a lot of toes tonight. And hurt a lot of kinfolk. What you got to remember, what you got to remember is the Bible is written primarily to teach doctrine. Uh, you're living today in an age of loose doctrine and departure from sound doctrine. And if there's one thing the Bible makes clear, especially in the books of Timothy, it makes it clear that the uh, young minister is to teach doctrine and spend his time studying doctrine and labor in sound doctrine. And the Bible says in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is given inspiration of God and is profitable for what? That's the first thing. People have funny ideas about the Word of God. I think some people think the Word of God was written, you know, to help you to, to share your love with your neighbor and that kind of business. Uh, the Bible wasn't written to get you healed or anything of the kind. Uh, the Bible has a plan of salvation in it, but that isn't why it was written. The primary purpose in God writing that book was to show you what was so and what wasn't so. That's the purpose in that book. And when the Holy Spirit came finally, who wrote that book? I mean, all scriptures give given inspiration of God. When the Holy Spirit finally came, you know what Jesus Christ said about his coming? He said, when he has come, he is the spirit of truth and will guide and lead you into all truth. So the first work of the Holy Spirit with that book is to take that book, when you open that book, show you what is so and what's not so. Now, the rest of it you may find different things, but it's mainly for doctrine. I know it's profitable for reproof, uh, correction, destruction, righteousness, so the man of God may be uh, perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. I believe that. I believe that. But that isn't the primary purpose. The primary purpose is doctrine. Doctrine. In the last days, they'll depart from uh, the faith, giving the heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I'm going to talk tonight about the Antichrist, and I'm going to give you his mark, and his number, and his name, and his letter, and his sign, and his race, and his religion. That ought to be enough for tonight. <laughs> And if Hal Lindsay and Salem Kerban can't keep up, that's their problem. I've got, I've got a King James Bible, it's way ahead of them. Way ahead of them. Alright, now, to begin with, if you have a Bible, a turn to Revelation, get Revelation chapter 4 in one hand, and Revelation chapter 19 in the other. Revelation 4 and Revelation 19. We'll begin to talk about some basic things first before we try to identify this character. The Antichrist is the prominent character of Scripture. Outside the Lord Jesus Christ himself, there are more references in the Bible to the Antichrist than any other man. I, whether you notice or not or ever observe the thing, but there, in the Bible there are 18 types of Antichrist. 18 of them. There's only 21 types of Christ in the major characters. And there are 18 types of Antichrist. There's more information in the Bible on the Antichrist than there is on Paul and David and Moses, Peter, James, and John. The Antichrist, the second outstanding character in the Word of God. Why right, do you get Revelation chapter 4 there, and look at it, and look along about verse 1 and verse 2 there, and notice what John is talking about. He says, After these things he saw a door open in heaven, and a voice, the first voice, like as a trumpet, said, Come up hither, and immediately he was in the Spirit. The door was open in heaven, and a picture of the rapture. A voice said, Come up hither, and he was caught up there, and when he was caught up there, he saw a throne, him and sat upon it. There's somebody sitting on the throne. Now, that's a picture of the rapture. Look at the last verse in chapter 3. He that hath the ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith the churches. See that? Now, look at the last verse in chapter 2. Last verse in chapter 2. He that hath the ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith the churches. Now, it's that word church and churches. That word church and churches occurs all through Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, and when you get to chapter 4, the church is gone. Look at Revelation chapter 2, and look how that thing starts. Under the church at Ephesus, right. Come on out about five or six verses, 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith, the churches. Come on a little bit further, the church at Thyatira, and the church at Sardis, or the church at Pergamos. You get to chapter 3 and begin chapter 3, I think that's Sardis beginning at chapter 3, uh, to the church of Sardis. Look toward the end of chapter uh, 3 after Philadelphia. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Churches, 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 church, church, churches, churches. Get chapter 4 and see if you can find the word church. It isn't there. It's gone. You'll find no church in chapter 4, no church in chapter 5. The word church, the word churches doesn't occur in chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. The church is gone. Now something happens to the church. Revelation chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and in chapter 4, a door opens and somebody goes up. Now turn to Revelation 19. Only two times in that book of Revelation, a door opens in heaven, or heaven opens at least. And one time somebody goes up, next time somebody comes down. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, the book, of, uh, the book of Revelation not hard to understand, it's hard to believe. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, to him that sat upon it. Revelation 19, 11, down he comes. All right, now we know where we're at. In chapter 4, somebody goes up, in chapter 19, somebody comes down. That means the book, rest of the book of Revelation, chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, is along in here someplace. And the events we're going to talk about tonight take place during this period. Now, you've got to get your Bible right. The Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth has proper divisions, and those divisions must be observed. Uh, folks say, well, just your interpretation. We never fool with interpretation. We fool with what it says. <laughs> Some say, well, you, you think it teaches this, and you think it teaches that. I was in a spa the other day, sitting there in the steam room down there in Pensacola, and the guy came in and started talking to me. He's a college graduate, been in my church a couple of times, and he said, well, I'm confused. I said, why is that? He said, well, I go to your church, you quote the scripture, you talk like you know what you're talking about. He said, I go down to the Campbellite church, and he quotes the scripture like he knows what he's talking about. And if each one of these fellows quotes it like they knew exactly what they were saying, they were telling the truth, yet they differ, how can I tell who's telling the truth? And I said, you're kidding, aren't you? He said, no. I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. He said, what do you mean? I said, how old are you? He said, 25. I said, you got a college education? He said, yes. I said, you're a disgrace. <laughs> and the guy said, what do you mean by that? I said, you mean to tell me a 25-year-old college-educated man can't check two things out to see which one is so? Go back to sucking your bottle, you baby. I mean, the very idea, if one preacher says the scripture, another one uses something against it, why don't you go home and read it and see which one lied to you? Amen. You insincere, lazy, good-for-nothing rascal. With your college education, you have no zeal for the truth. You don't even check it. Somebody says, well, this one says this thing, one says that. How do I know what to believe? Check it out, stupid. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. You know, I've often thought of doing this. I've never done it and probably never will. Uh, you know, there's certain things you kind of, you know, it, 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 the Lord wouldn't bless it because it'd just be for sheer spite. But, but sometimes I get these ideas, you know. There's nothing better than a country southern church. If you've never had a revival in a southern Baptist church in Alabama and Mississippi, you've missed Deadsville. <laughs> Um, they are the deadest, man. You get out there in one of those churches where they've got the cooperative program and the adult quarterly and some old deacon stand there and so we should give our money to the cooperative program. <laughs> I've been in, I've been meetings out there like that. You know, one family ran the church for six years and they get a new preacher every three years and everybody knows everybody's tricks. You talk about something dead, my land. And I've been out in those places just beat my brains out trying to get those folks awake and alive and loving the Lord. And sometimes I've just been in despair. And I, I thought to myself, next time I have a meeting on one of these places, Monday night I'm going to get up and prove from the Bible there isn't any hell. <laughs> and I could do it, too. I could do it. And then Tuesday night, prove there is a hell. And then Wednesday night, prove you had to be baptized to be saved. And then Thursday night, prove you didn't have to be baptized to be saved. That's right. And then get up Friday night and prove the day to keep was the seventh day Saturday. And then get up the next night and prove the first day of the week Sunday was the day you should keep. And then the Sunday morning prove you could lose your salvation. And Sunday night prove you couldn't. 
And then when I left, stand up there and say, well, folks, that's it. <laughs> and say, but don't forget, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but then there are the ways of death. Bye-bye. <laughs> and just leave them stirring all around. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> now, I'm never going to do that, but I often thought about doing that. Now, the Bible has proper divisions. You've got to get your divisions right. For example, when Jesus Christ came up from the dead, he took up the Old Testament saints with him. That's rapture number one. When he comes from the church, you catch up the New Testament saints with him. That's rapture number two. Right before then, the tribulation, the tribulation saints are caught out. That's rapture number three. Three raptures. Study to show thy fellow self approved unto God. A word meaneth not to be ashamed, right dividing the word of truth. There's a difference. Did you ever wonder in your Bible why it doesn't say, this is the first resurrection to Revelation 20? Because the first resurrection isn't over till that whole period is over. When you go up to see the Lord when he comes, that isn't the first resurrection. That's just the main part of it. It isn't over till there. So he didn't say to Revelation 20, this is the first resurrection. Let's make it plain. You plant tomatoes. You go out and get a few of them, first fruits. They get all get right and you harvest them. But you don't get all of them, you go out and clean them. Didn't you ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, those that are Christ at his coming, and then come at the end. You could, how could you miss it? Here's a bunch of people up down this country saying the Christian go through the tribulation. Why, these American Christians are so soft and so spoiled, they think if gas goes up to two dollars a gallon, they got into the tribulation. <laughs> That's right, brother. And they're trying to teach, well, the Christian go in the tribulation because the rapture doesn't occur till the end of the tribulation. You got the wrong rapture, man. That isn't a rapture of church age saints. That's a rapture of tribulation saints. There's a difference. You gotta get the difference. Two drunks were argued one night. One of them said, I don't care what you say, there's a difference. The other one said, You can't tell me there's any difference between aggravation and agitation and frustration. <laughs> All the same word. And the first drunk said, I'm telling you, the frustration and agitation and aggravation are the same thing. I thought, well, let me see you prove it. So I'll show you. He picked the phone book about 12 o'clock at night. He said, now, he said, I'm an aggravated fellow. <laughs> he dialed the number. <laughs> and the guy answered, hello, kind of sleepy voice. The drunk said, hello, put Mr. Newberry on the phone. And the guy said, you got the wrong address, buddy. Don't tell me I got the wrong address. I want to talk to Mr. Newberry. <laughs> and the guy said, buddy, it's 12 o'clock at night. You're some crazy drunk. Hang up. I want to talk to Mr. Newberry. Click. Down with the phone. And the old drunk sat there about five minutes. He turned to his buddy and said, That was aggravation. And I'm more agitated. <laughs> Dial the same number again. <laughs> and the guy came on the phone and he said, Mr. Newberry, come in here. <laughs> and the guy said, You crazy drunk, hang up. It's 12, 15 at night. I want some sleep. I want to talk to Mr. Newberry. He comes in. Click. I don't drunk sat there about five minutes and he said to his buddy, and now the more frustrated. <laughs> he saw that number again. <laughs> and the guy said, hello. And he said, the drunk said, hello, this is Mr. Newberry. Been any calls there for me? <laughs> <laughs> now you got to admit there's a difference. <laughs> Now, when you study the Bible, you see, the trouble is, these people have lost the power of negative thinking. <laughs> and when you pick up your Bible, one of the best ways to find the truth is, instead of getting the stuff together, get it apart. Instead of jamming the verse together, split them up. I mean, what God has joined together, let not man and put asunder. What God has put asunder, let not man join together. There's certain things that don't fit. Those are three separate resurrections. Now, we're going to talk about this gentleman right here. You say, well, that isn't a gentleman, that's a cat. Yeah, but Christ is called a lamb. And the devil is called a lamb. And prayer warriors are called eagles. And Pharisees are called serpents. And the Antichrist is called a leopard. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Look out for the 13 from now on. Jeremiah 13, 23. 
Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard change his spots? That's the thing. Oh, I now turn to Revelation chapter 13. And look out for the 13th. Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and verse 2. Nothing like a Bible occurred for college education. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and verse 2. Talking about the beast that comes out of the sea. Is there any doubt about who he is? Look at verse 18. Here is the mind that hath wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. The Antichrist. Go back to verse 2. And the beast I saw was like a leopard. Like a leopard. That word there for a cat in Latin is Felix. A black leopard is a panther. Of course, the American name for a cat is a little bit different. It's lynx. As in the automobile ad. That some of you folks have been watching on your TV. Where America has turned to the cat. You better watch your steps. The entrance by word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. Do you ever study words of M and X? How you like that one? You reckon there's anything to it? Probably not, just coincidence. Alright, now take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, look at verse 1 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 6, a man shows up on a white horse. The first beast, when the first seal is open, says to John, come and see. And when John comes and takes a look, you know what he sees? He sees a man on a white horse. And the man has a crown. Notice the passage. And he has a bow. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer. He's a white horse rider, and he comes with a crown, and he comes with a bow, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. You know what, you know who all the major seminaries say that fellow is? They say it's Jesus Christ. They say that when Christ came, he came as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's walking across the earth and conquering the earth, and someday all the earth will be converted to Christ. We call that teaching post-millennialism. Uh, they used to sing, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage for the grapes of wrath are stored. His truth is marching on. You see, they thought he was bringing in the kingdom. Down south they sang, Are the masters say, Ha ha, and the darkies say, Ho ho, for it must be that the kingdom and the coming in the year of Jubilee. They thought the kingdom was coming in 1865. Some kingdom, boy, some kingdom. Two world wars, Philippine insurrection, Vietnam, Korea, that's the kingdom, is it? That's the kingdom that's coming? Who's ever king of that kingdom, you better kick him off the throne and impeach him. <laughs> that isn't the Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes back, it's glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill to men. Somebody's got the kingdom messed up there somewhere. We're not waiting for the kingdom to come anyway, we're waiting for the church to go. You've got to get the thing right. There's a difference. There's a difference. Blessed be the destructive, critical mind <laughs> these days. <laughs> but not, not, not enough of them. All the unsaved people are critical and destructive, and all the Christians are positive and constructive. You couldn't get a more unbalanced mess. I'm skeptical of skepticism. <laughs> now you take that right on that white horse. Is that Jesus Christ? Let's see if it is. Turn to Revelation 19. Scripture with Scripture. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that needeth the right not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, get the scriptures there, Revelation 19. Right when you were, verse 11, 12, along in there. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. All right, they both have white horses. Now look at them carefully. In Revelation 19, look at it carefully, Revelation 19. Does that rider have a crown on his head? Many crowns, isn't it? 
Let me ask you about that, that right in Revelation 19. Has he got a bow? What has he got? He has a sword coming out of his mouth, doesn't he? Is there any question about who that rider is in Revelation 19? Look at it. On his vesture and his thigh he has the name written, and his name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's called the Word of God. So no question about him, is there? Well, the white horse rider in Revelation 19 is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that one isn't. Well then, who that? <laughs> I mean, who is that character if he's not Christ? He's an awful lot like Christ. He's so much like Christ that every major Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Episcopal, and Catholic seminary in the world teaches is Jesus Christ. When I say major Baptist seminary, I'm not talking about independent Baptist. We're small fry. So not the independent Baptists get thinking they're too big. You, you're, you're very small. I mean, Bob Jones University in San Francisco and Tennessee Temple and Jerry Falwell and Hiles Anderson put together wouldn't even make up one twentieth of the personnel in Catholic colleges. Not one twentieth. And they teach that White Horse right of Jesus Christ. But he's not. Well, who is he? Well, you've got to admit, whatever he is, he's a perfect counterfeit of Jesus Christ. I mean, whatever he is, he's awful close to him. He comes riding on a white horse, and the Lord has a white horse. Matter of fact, he's so close to him, he's almost identical. I think that's the word. <laughs> Did you ever study words at the X? <laughs> Probably nothing to it. I mean, this fellow comes along, he's not the real thing, he's a joke. He doesn't come to help the world, he comes to vex the world, or you might say, he's a jinx. <clears throat> just that it wasn't in an X. Probably nothing to it. So this fellow shows up, and he's just like Jesus Christ. Brethren, the greatest imitation of Jesus Christ to ever live is not Thomas a Kempis. The greatest imitation of Jesus Christ is the devil. If you have a new Bible, I say a new Bible, I mean any of the, any of the new trash. You have a verse there that says, be imitators of God as dear children. That isn't what the verse read. It should have been, be followers of God. An imitator is a counterfeit. It isn't the real thing. Now, give us something how close the devil is to Jesus Christ. For example, you know Jesus Christ is called Christ? You know what that word is in the Old Testament? It's anointed. Christos in the New Testament. Mashiach in the Old Testament. A Messiah. An anointed one. You know what the devil is called in Ezekiel chapter 28? He's called the anointed cherub that covers. You know what Jesus Christ about him said about himself? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that old serpent, the devil, your adversary, goes about as a roaring lion, and Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. You couldn't tell him apart. If you didn't have a Bible to show you these things, you couldn't possibly get them apart. You better look out for balls of fire in your bedroom and visions at the bottom of the bed where I saw a man and he stood and he said to me, you better watch that stuff. You think Martin Luther woke up one night and the Lord was standing in front of him and said he was Jesus Christ. Martin threw an inkwell at him. Martin was much more discerning than charismatic. If he'd been a charismatic, he'd have fell down on his feet and then wrote a psalm the next morning and made some money off it. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Martin threw an ink well at him. If you go over there, you can find that ink spot on the wall there where he slung that thing at him. Uh, Martin, you know what Martin said of that operation? He said, you're not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ up at the right hand of God. Blah! I mean, he had the doctrine right. Now you take that thing right there. Give us something about this. Jesus Christ has a city, and she's a bride, New Jerusalem, and the devil has a city, and she's a bride, she's Babylon. You remember Jesus Christ, the Mount of Temptation, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. You know what the devil did? He called the scripture and said, it is written, and pulled the Psalm 90 right back to it. Ever start thinking about those things? The, most, the greatest counterfeit of Jesus Christ that ever lived is Satan. For example... No wonder, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And Jesus Christ in the Bible is called the angel of the Lord. But the devil is an angel of light, and God is light. And in him there is no darkness. You couldn't possibly tell them apart. Now listen, brethren. Every movement, every movement in politics, art, 
music, science, education, to get everybody together. Can only do it by erasing distinctions. And when you erase distinctions, then you get a counterfeit that you can't spot. That's what's shaping up. Some counterfeits are obvious. I mean, some things are obviously such a poor counterfeit you couldn't miss it. Like a little boy wanted to be added from school one day, so he phoned the principal, and he said, Bobby Jones is sick and cannot come today. <laughs> and the principal said, who is this speaking? And the boy said, his father. <laughs> well, you know, that isn't going to work. Uh, a little old boy saying, his father. That, that counterfeit can't fool anybody. But this counterfeit here is real close. If you just take down enough, enough distinctions, the devil can step right in and be Jesus Christ as far as you're concerned. Down south years ago, we used to have what we call simultaneous revival meetings. And those simultaneous revival meetings uh, have a sign out in the front yard and it said, Jesus Christ is the answer. That went on about ten years. And they changed it and they put out Christ as the answer. And they changed it after about ten years and put God as the answer. And that bunch went out with a television program called This is the Answer. <laughs> now somebody backslid. See, Christ is not his name, that's his title. Simeon was showed that he wouldn't die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Acts chapter 4. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. There are several Christs. There are several of them. Take your pick. Christ's a title. It's a perfect imitation. It's a counterfeit. Tell you something else about this fellow up here. He's a king. He has a crown. I believe the word is rex in the Latin. And if he's a leader, it goes like that. They cut off heads in the tribulation. And I suppose they bury you in a box. Did you ever study words in that? Probably nothing to it. All right, these things here are so close, you couldn't tell them apart aside from the Bible and the Holy Spirit. You know, you never have to worry about people like uh, Brother Modlish and, and me and some of the other characters you have to listen to, Brother Sabaka, because they can't fool anybody. We're not slick enough. We're not, we're not wolves in sheep's clothing, we're sheep in wolves' clothing. <laughs> and you never have to worry about a guy who gets up there and roars and rants and pounds, because whether you like him or not, at least he's going to shoot straight with you. What you got to look out for is this business. Oh, yeah. If they'd kill him, they couldn't bury him anyway. They don't have a pole ball. <laughs> oh, yeah, ma'am. We're going to make a lot of friends tonight. <laughs> Back in the Dark Ages, they said, what's the difference between an accident and a calamity? And they said, if the Pope fell in the Tiber River, that'd be an accident. If somebody pulled him out, that'd be a calamity. <laughs> People had a sense of humor back in those days. Now you take that thing right there, it's that smooth, slick thing. Now I was raised in that. You would never guess that to look at me. Like I said, I'm a reactionary. But I was raised in a high church, Anglican, Episcopal. You know, where Charlie and Brian just got married, one of those places. Big stained glass windows, you know, opera singers in the choir, pipe organ 20 feet high, that kind of thing. He come in there and that guy say, The Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. You know. Amen, 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 amen. I'm sitting there thinking, ah, rat. I mean, I, I mean, I went to that, I went that church when I was a little boy, about six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. I never understood one cotton picking word that fellow said the whole time I was in there. I was catechized, confirmed, christened, all that mess. I don't know what he's talking about. And I'd stand up at the door, I'd get the shock of my life. I'd go out the door, and I thought that the way he talked in the pulpit was the way he was, see. I didn't know the guy was a hypocrite. And I figured when he got the door, he'd say, Good morning, Mrs. Jones. How are you today? Glad to see you, Brother Smith. So glad to have you in the day. But he didn't talk that way. He got the door, How are you doing? So he could be out the golf and have a big deal, like kind of I couldn't figure that out. Because the guy get up there and roll, roll, roll. He drone and drone and drone. They get in those great sanctuaries where the light kind of go down. You know, it's cool and quiet. I mean, everybody got the nerves on the edge from being drunk the night before, and they got to have it. You know, nothing exciting going on. And then he start and he 
turn off all the lights, put the lectern, split chancel, you know, one pulpit over there and one over there. You figure that out, can't you? You know that's what that's what done that way? So in the center of your attention is called to the jug of liquor and the communion table. Can't you figure that out? They're trying to make a drunk out of you. The word of God is pulled off over here. In a Bible-believing church, the Bible's right in the middle. It is sitting off on the side with a liquor bottle in the middle. And he'd get up there and he'd say, And so I see Simon Peter walking on the water, and in my mind's eye, I see him as he grows, goes across those billowous waves, and our Lord says, Now you see how attentive you are right now? You waiting for me to say something, I ain't going to say anything. I mean, he go on like that for 30 minutes. You just wait. Okay, let's have it. Let's have it. He had nothing for you. 30 minutes later, and so I see, has it, man, I'd sit there and I was about 12 or 13 years old, little old boy sitting there looking at those big old arches in the dark, you know. I've been watching movies all week like you've been doing. Except I saw him down in the theater. You've been watching the living room. And I was sitting down there and that thing looking at the arches and I was seeing Tarzan swing down there called, <laughs> oh yeah, man. And about that time, I'd I'd have I'd see gangbusters or some guy come in and steal the money out of the collection plate, you know. And, and he start to the door. And I'd trip him, you know, and I'd be the big hero and all that jazz, you know. You know, I was getting a lot out of those services. <laughs> you take that fellow; he was just as smooth and slick as a greaseball bear, and just as lost as a Madison Avenue salesman in Oakie and Oakie Swamp, boy. I went to hell in that church off for 15 years and never learned nothing. God bless you. The Lord bless you. Well, praise the Lord. Well, God bless you. Well, hallelujah, brother. Well, bless the Lord. Yes, God is so good. That's the bird you got to look out for. That's the bird right there. You don't have to worry about these old fellows in Carolina. You don't have to worry about them. Those old preachers up there. I've seen them bend over the pulpit. Those little old boys sitting down in the front row about five, or six, seven years old. Those old mountain preachers. And son, you're going to burn in hell if you don't get right. You don't want to burn in hell, do you? <laughs> Drive a psychiatrist crazy, man. <laughs> I, a lot of those boys get saved, boy. You bet your life for those little ten, eight-year-old boys sit there. <laughs> they get saved, man. They get saved. All right. Take this man here. He's a he's a bowman. He's got a bow. Could you ever look at a bowman? I thought he takes that thing and he's it's a heavy bow. He's got three fingers and pull that thing back and lets it go. But not an Oriental. An Oriental has a light bow. The heaviest bow they got sixty pounds. Some are forty. And when he takes that thing back, he pulls it back like this and lets it go like that. I mean, the Boy Scouts they don't do it like that for nothing. Now, you see that thing right there? That's a very interesting thing. Did you look at that? <laughs> <laughs> Fellow wants a jigger. You know what a jigger is? It's two fingers. Fellow that means peace. It does. I don't know when that ever meant peace anywhere I've ever seen. I've got a picture at home of a SS uh, recruiting uh, troops in Denmark and Holland and Norway and Sweden. And they got one hand down the flag, the other hand up like that. It's a loyalty oath to death. That's what the Swiss bodyguard does, and at the Vatican when they enlist. When did that ever mean peace? We got any infantrymen here tonight? Infantrymen. We got any here tonight? Let me see your hands. All right, boys, what's this? <laughs> you know what that signal is? Does that mean peace? <laughs> That's an a bayonet assault, man. Got a guy here in the tank corps? Anybody ever serve as a tanker? Guy stands up in the lead tank and gives it that. What's he saying? God bless you, brother. <laughs> that thing, well, that thing's an attack, man. That thing has been used as attack by military men, by bowmen for years and years and years. Why years before they ever knew what a hippie was? Or a hippie. Peace. You think that means peace? You know. All this stuff. Well, when Winnie Churchill held that thing up, he wouldn't know about peace. He meant V for victory, unconditional surrender. You think that means peace? Takes you to go over to Salerno or Naples when they get off the ship, get in that and see how many friends you make. <laughs> Bunch of gullible, stupid Americans. They don't have a sense God gave a brass monkey. 
I'm driving down the street to go behind a bus and a bunch of kids in the bus wave at me. You know, they see my gospel sign in my car and they know I'm clergy and they... I give them this. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, bugs them something fierce, man. Bugs them something fierce. Where did you get the idea that thing meant peace? Where did you get that from? I mean, the fellow says, you know, he's going to cross his... The fellow says, I told a lie, but I had my fingers crossed. Cross. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's crooks. I remember that one. Did you ever study words down in X? <laughs> Seems to me most of the trouble now came from that fellow. They're probably, probably just coincidence. Or he takes this bow and he pulls the thing back like that and he's got that. See? The fellow says, Bless you. The sign of the cross. A blessing? Listen. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That's a sign of a curse. He said the Christians always use that. Yeah, the dumb, stupid, Bible-rejecting Christians always use that. Not the ones that believe it. Who would use a thing like that for a blessing in view of what the Bible said about it? That's a curse. You've got to have the power of negative insight, boy. Isn't this strange how negative and critical they are of the Word of God, and yet how positive they are about the devil? You people watch these Dracula shows, and these uh, uh, horror shows, and blood-sucking Frankenstein and stuff, and some guy comes to the woodcross, you know, puts him in the... That guy can't stand the woodcross. <laughs> you better have not pull a woodcross in front of him. He got 20 of them around his neck, man. Let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Where did you find in any Bible where anybody used a cross to get rid of a demon? Well, then, where do you get that stuff? Martin Luther King goes over to see the Pope, and the Pope says, The Lord bless you, brother. Bam! He's dead in the streets. That's where Kennedy went for it, got his brain blown out. Jack Kennedy goes over there, the Lord bless you. Bam! Dead in the streets. Bobby Kennedy goes over there, bless you. Bam! He's dead in the hotel lobby. Boy, if that bird puts that thing in me, I'm going to say, Knock it off, bud. Knock it off. <laughs> I don't want that thing on me. Don't you give me that hex stuff there. Hex. You know what hex is in the Greek? Well, that's easy. It's the word for six. Did you ever study words in M X? Probably nothing to it. Oh, I take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter uh, 9, I think it is. Make it Daniel 8, 25. Daniel 8, 25. Daniel 8, 25. When the Antichrist comes in, Daniel 8, 25, how does he come in? How does what it say? Peaceably. Peaceably. See that? There's another passage in Daniel that says he'll destroy many with peace. Is that that one there or is that another one? That's the one there. Or Daniel 8, 25, he'll destroy many by peace. I remember that one. That's Pax. Pax Romana. Roman peace. I've got that one. You ever study words at MX? If it's a black cat and it's a black spot, you know the word for black, don't you? Surely you do. Stakes. Sticks. You ever study words at MX? Something right there. That thing there is yellow brown. Like an Asiatic. And it has a white stomach, like a European. And it has black spots all over it. Do you ever see a tiger? A tiger is yellow-brown, like an Asiatic. He has a white stomach, like a European. And he has black stripes all over it. Put a tiger in your tank was S.O., but uh-oh, <laughs> he changed it. It's Exxon. Probably nothing to it. Put a rabbit in your tank for short hops. <laughs> All right. That thing, that thing comes down to Exxon. Isn't that a strange thing, that letter X? You know what they say, don't you? They say X marks the spot. 
You can't sign your name, you just put down X. What is X? That's the unknown quantity in mathematics. That thing, that letter is X. There isn't any question about what the thing is. Look at there. X, X, X. They're just sitting up in my hand. If you turn them over, it'd be three X's sitting right there. Now over there in uh, Egypt, the three pyramids sitting right back. And right beside him is a sphinx. Well, you know what that sphinx is? Why, it's hermaphrodite. It's half woman and half man, and it's a cat. A fellow says, what is the riddle of the sphinx? Why, Kirbon and Lindsay couldn't find it if they stayed up all night. Once you begin to correct the King James Bible, you lose the key. If you flew over that thing, you know what you'd say? You'd see that cat lying there, and then right beside it, here's what you'd see. XXX. Did that too. Three in a row. I'll give you a good one. Christmas time comes around. Oh, yeah. What was his name? Santa Claus. <laughs> That's a strange thing. How many Spanish-speaking people we have here tonight? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with Santa Barbara and Santa Lucia. But who ever heard of a man named Santa? Is it Santa Luis Obispo? <laughs> it's Santa Barbara, but should it not... Santa Jose, S-A-N is a masculine, San Jose. What's that Santa doing in a man's name? That's a woman's designation. It's a maphrodite. You want light on gay liberation? Get your King James 1611 authorized verse. The entrance of thy word giveth understanding, it giveth a light, it giveth understanding to the simple. Nothing like a Bible occurred at the United Nations. Let's get into your living room. There it is. Push button. And on this side, six. And on that side, <laughs> tip that toe. Three in a row. When you play tip that toe, you put it down just like that. And then you get zero, zero, zero. Or you get X, X, X. Nothing like a Bible that turned up a crossword puzzle. All right, this thing here, this thing here is so close to Christ, he's a perfect imitation, but he's not Christ. That thing there is a counterfeit. He comes to vex the world. He's a hoax. He's a jinx. His letter is X. The Bible says the devil is an angel of light. There it is, Luke's. At Hollywood, or rather at, uh, at Christmas time, they kiss under the hollyhock, or the mistletoe, that's it, the mistletoe. They kiss under the mistletoe. You better retain that for just a minute. All right, there's mar the mark is a black spot. The number is 666. Right now, all the government cars in Israel, and the Arab cars in Israel, have 666 in the license plate. Right now, about eight computers put out by Montgomery Ward and J.C. Penny and that bunch have that number at the beginning of them. Have you got literature in your bookstore on that thing? Yeah, I think I just saw something there. Before you folks leave here, you ought to get that stuff. One fellow's gone and worked that thing out and showed you where, I think it's Weber, out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, one of those fellows. And they get you set up. All right, now, what's his name? He has a mark, he has a number, he has a name. Take your Bible and turn to John chapter 17, get that in one hand, and get Second Thessalonians chapter 2 in the other. John 17, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me tell you, boys and girls, there's more in that book than just how to be a good little boy or girl. That book is God's witness against this world system that men love darkness rather than light. Because the light is negative. It shows up the sin. Did you ever, did you ever look inside a theater during the daytime? Uh, I've seen janitors who worked in theaters, downtown theaters. And in the afternoon when that theater is, nobody's in there, and that janitor opens those fire exits and begin to clean that place out, you wouldn't believe it. If you look in that place, you wouldn't want to go in that building again. 
When the light shines in that thing, it's so full of dirt, it looks like a fog in those places. But you can't see the dirt till the light shines in. I said, you can't see the dirt till the light shines in. And when the light shines in, it doesn't show up what's good. It shows up what's bad. All right, John 17, 12. Father, those whom thou gavest me, I have kept them, and not as lost, save the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Judas Iscariot. Take your Bible, turn to Second Thessalonians. Pick up chapter 2. Uh, Beloved, be not uh, something upset, disturb us, the word letter is the day of Christ at hand. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Watch it. And that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. That thing right there? Scripture to scripture. When Antichrist shows up, he's a spirit that was on this earth before. It's a reincarnation. If Judas, take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. He won't appear as Judas. He'll profess to be God manifest in the flesh. He'll claim deity. But the Bible identifies it. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. And I had an angel over them, who was the king of the bottomless pit, who had his name in the Hebrew tongue, Abaddon, in the Greek tongue, Apollyon. Now see those two names there? You get home tonight, just get any Bible dictionary and look those things up. Both those words mean perdition, destruction. There's an angel in the bottomless pit right now who's going to come up. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. I think it's 17. I want a verse in 17 that says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of, what is it, 8? 8. Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast thou sawest was, he was a man who was living, and is not, he wasn't living at the time John wrote, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into where? That's the son of perdition. So Judas wasn't just a man, per se. He was, as they say down south, something else. Turn to John chapter 6 and see what he was. That verse I gave you in Revelation chapter 9 is what Charlie Manson said was his life verse. A killer out there in California, he claimed that he was the angel of the bottomless pit. Well, he's not, but he's a pretty good counterfeit because he had the mark right in his forehead. How many ever saw that picture? Let me see your hand. So you're not very observing, are you? When Elvis pressed the die, somebody laid a bunch of black flowers there in that grave in a great big black X. I don't know, I, nobody ever knew who anonymous sender. Nobody knew where it came from. Keep your eyes open. Be sober. Be vigilant. <laughs> All right, now you take that passage right there. John 6, verse 70. Jesus answered and said, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a what? Devil. Not the devil. A devil. See that thing? Now you take Judas Iscariot. When he betrayed Jesus Christ, you know what he did? He gave a sign to those that could capture him, and he said, the one whom I kiss is him. So he went for and forward and grabbed Jesus Christ and greeted him with a kiss and said, Hail, Master. And so to this day, when the teenagers sign their letters, they sign X, X, X meaning love and kisses. And there isn't any T.J. in New York knows why he does it. Not a one of them. That book is God's book and the hand of God's on that book. You can't explain that stuff. You stay up all night, you can't explain that stuff. You know how long Judas Iscariot is going to be the Antichrist? You know how long Jesus Christ preached on this earth? Three and a half years. 42 months. Do you know how Jesus Christ died? Do you know how Judas died? Do you know what the word Judas is? Well, that's easy. That's the Greek for the tribe of Judah. The perfect counterfeit. You couldn't possibly see through it unless you had a Bible and the Holy Spirit show you and read the book. It's a perfect counterfeit. 
Now you take that thing right there. It's that last name right there. The Bible said angel had a Hebrew name and a Greek name. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 48. Jeremiah chapter 48. Now, I, I, I suppose you people are fairly intelligent. I make fun of you and rub it in sometimes. But I do it because you know how lazy you are when it comes to the Bible, not because of your lack of education. I mean, to my mind, a man who's as stupid is a man that leaves a Bible around with, with dust on it. Not a fellow you know hasn't finished high school. And you people, don't you know what's going on? Can't you see it? I'm your phone up. Uh, I'd like to contact so and so. Uh, phone information. What's the number? Oh four two seven six five four three six seven. Area code. There isn't a college graduate in the world unless he's a genius who can remember more than ten digits in a row. They're giving you twelve up each time. You dial one number, it's the wrong number. They give you a new number, the number has changed. I have sat by a telephone and written down thirty-five numbers before I got where I was going. Well, in the old days, you didn't do that at all. You just an operator, get me the thing. The thing came through. It's a numbers racket. You know what they got on you? They got your social security number, your bank account number, your zip code number, your area code number, your license plate number, your house number, your telephone number, and then some more too. Your social security number. They're setting you up in a number system. Now they're going to set you up in a thing where when you go down that grocery store to buy your groceries, they're going to run that thing across that scanner. If you don't have that thing in the palm of your hand or on your forehead, you don't get your groceries. That's how that thing's going to go. You say, what's that? That's the end of progressive education and scientific achievement. The total of Darwin's peak is worshiping Satan. That's the ultimate level. That's where the brains wind up. They wind up worshiping the devil. Now you take that thing right there. Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 24, verse 41. You see that place called Kirioth? The judgment is on Kirioth? Kirioth? Look at that chapter right there carefully. Look at those judgments against. Against Moab. What verse is Moab in? All right, find it again. So that's two or three times, huh? Anybody know where Moab is? Anybody know where the Moabites came from? Yeah, the lot son by his daughter drunk in a cave. They're incest. The half breed. They're part one race and part another. Lot winds up drunk in a cage. Genesis chapter 20 and his two daughters commit incest with him and produce the Ammonites and the Moabites. Moab is across Jordan in Syria. Syria. Now you're getting close to a morning newspaper. Except the morning newspapers don't know what they're talking about and the King James Bible does. I always trust what was written in the 1611 before what was written in 1980. You always be safe going back 300 years. You always be further ahead. So what you have here is a Syrian Jew. The only person outside that land of Palestine that Christ chose for disciples was a man from Kirioth. Now you see that? That word in Hebrew looks like that. Ish. Ish. A man, a man of Kirioth, the fellow's from Moab, it's in Syria. He's a half-breed. That fellow's a perfect combination of Ham, the African, Shem, the Asiatic, and Japheth, the Caucasian. He's a tiger. <laughs> He's a tiger. Back when I used to play in dance bands, you know what they call the Negro musicians? They call them cats. And if the guy was a good player, he was a cool cat. And they use the word more vulgar terms than other branches. If you can't find out, if you can't find out what's going on, get your Bible and it'll open up to you. Oh, I have got all this information on him here. Now, you surely have to have a religion. Give yeah, a look at this. The Bible says, Cursed is he that hangs on a tree. I have always been suspicious of electricity. (laughs) 
You ever see those big iron things out there like this, you know, with the <laughs> insulators on them? All that current running up and down there? What's electricity? I never met an electrician in my life that could tell you what it is. This is based on magnetism. What's magnetism? They don't know. They don't know. Take that thing right there. You know what Jesus Christ said? Many, many years before Ben Franklin got out in the rainstorm, got messed around with the lightning and the key, Christ said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. I don't trust that stuff. How many of you have ever been in the taping business, taping Christian tapes when they see your hands? All right, if you don't believe in demons and don't believe in the devil, that you do. You get in the tape ministry recording and taping sermons and Christian stuff. And do it for two years and then tell me what you think. Man, I've gone back and, and I've taped the machine and found the spindle clear across the room on the other side. I've gone there after I raised the whole tape and come across there and something was on it. I've gone in there and checked the tape and made sure the record button was off and the rest of them were off and the thing was blank when I got through it. I've seen some things. I preached one time up in Holland, Michigan and got through preaching. The guy said to me, he said, uh, come out of my basement and I had to hear something. And we went down there and he put on this tape. It's a brand new tape he just bought. And he checked the thing before he played it, demagnetized it, make sure it didn't have nothing on it, this and that. He came through one closed circuit in my microphone where there wasn't anything else plugged in. And I was preaching on demons. And as I'd preach on demons, a voice would come along right behind my voice, and when I'd stop, the voice would stop. And sometimes there'd be four or five voices there. When I'd pause, they'd pause. When I'd go, they'd go. And if you listen real carefully to that thing, those voices, you know what those voices were doing? They were reporting in military terms. I couldn't repeat the terms, I'm not familiar with them. But they were reporting military terms for a Russian attack on Alaska. And they were planes putting out the signal to coastal places and the coast of going back to planes. You say, when was that? About 1965. You say, where did that stuff come? Beat the fire to me, man, I don't know. I just not always been suspicious of electricity. I don't like it. That stuff bugs me. Bugs me. I, I, I worry about something you can't see and can kill you. Makes me nervous. <laughs> All right. You take this thing here. What religion? Well, I hate to say this, brethren. But I only know one religion in the world where a fellow walks out with a half a grapefruit on top of his head. <laughs> and lets people bow down and kiss his foot and kiss his ring. And it's not the Baptist. <laughs> and it's not the Presbyterian. There's only one man on this earth that wants the title reserved to God the Father. Jesus Christ called God the Father, Holy Father. John chapter 17. If I was the devil wanted to get worship, I'd get in that church to get the worship. That fellow has on his crown, or did that took his crown off, had a little inscription that went like this. He wore it for about four or five hundred years. You wouldn't catch him now with it, there's too much light. And it said, Vicarious Philidae. Now the Bible says his number is 666. When that rascal was over here, and as far as I'm concerned, he's a rascal, Christ said, they'll come in my name. Now some of you bigots don't understand that, but you'd be broad-minded. That's when he came over here, he, he came over in the name of Christ, and he said, you better look out for false prophets that come in my name. He didn't say in the name of Karl Marx. In my name. He was over here for six days and six hours and visited six cities. Got the newspaper clipping at home. Now you sitting right there? Those are Roman letters, and some of them are Roman numerals. If it's 666, it's a number below a thousand. Well, that M is a foul. That M, letter M in Roman numerals is a foul. Millennia. This number is under a foul. What are the letters under a foul? D, C, L, V, X, I. Every one of those Roman letters, Latin letters, is a Roman numeral. 500, 600, 650, 660, 665, 666. How many letters? <laughs> the six of them. There are only six Roman numerals under a thousand, and all six of them add up to 666. 
Here is a mind that hath wisdom. Let him and cast understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Well, 100 plus 500 is 600. 650, 660, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66. And the E, A, and R are not, and S are not Roman numerals. The ones that are there are 666. Our father said you can add up another way, you know, this numerology, what they call gematria. You can make it Nero Kaiser, Nero Caesar. Maybe you can, but Nero Caesar was king of Rome. Somebody said Vita El Duce adds up to 666, but El Duce was a dictator in Rome. You can't beat that thing with a stick. That thing comes to Rome every time you fool it. Now look over here. See this word? That's a very interesting word. In Germany, they say it like that. Sometimes you get it like this. Or if it's complete and really right, you get it like that. Or you can write it like this. Or if you're an American, you say it like that. Now you said word? That's the same word. That means whole, complete. You want to try it like this? How about this? Hallowed be thy name. That word means whole, complete, nothing missing. You thought say hello to a fellow, you're wishing him good health. Heal, whole, high. It's the same word. Now, suppose I said this. I said, this fellow is an owl coal holic. My fellow from the region. Well, let's see. If he's alcoholic, he's wholly or completely given alcohol. I mean, the roof there. Now suppose he was a cat hole. Also. Then he's wholly given to a cat. Holy cat. <laughs> Now, that is how it's going to come out. Now, just don't make any mistake about it. I've got a perfect right to say what I'm saying, and you have no right to correct me because I was a good Catholic before I was saved, and probably a lot better one than you are right now. So don't waste my time and try to keep me awake. I put the palm leaf, I took the palm leaf home on Sunday and put it up there in the mantle, and boy, Ash Wednesday came around, I knelt down there and kissed the statue, and that bishop went by and put that black stuff out there in the palm of his hand, I took that old black spot and put it right in the middle of my forehead. X marks the spot. How many of you Catholics up here, how many of you Christians up here, along about Ash Wednesday, see a bunch of folks around town without a spot on them, let see your hand. You ever seen that? My, my priest told me, if you're a good Catholic, you wear that in your forehead all day long. I was a good Catholic. I wore it all day long down the radio station. Kennedy didn't wear his, a backslider. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Claire Booth Luce didn't wear hers. Coward, yellow. Listen, I was tied in that little old box out there for I was safe. Tip that toe free and over time angles rang, man. I was a good Catholic. So I've got a right to say what I'm going to say, and I'm going to say it. Now, Ted, I'm going to say it. Number one, just because you're a Catholic, that doesn't mean you're damned. I think a lot of Catholics are saved in spite of the church. I've been in Catholic homes, the only Bible they have in the home was the King James Bible. Please have a fit if you knew that. you got Catholics all over America listening to Billy Graham and Rex Humbart and Jerry Fowell every Sunday. They think they're getting Catholic doctrine, but they're not. I think a lot of Catholics are saved in spite of what the priest says. I believe that. But I'm going to tell you this, brother, sister. If you were still in that outfit, if I were you, I would fly away and get out as quick as I could get and take whatever I have with me and go running because hard times are coming. Now, this hasn't happened yet, and this gentleman doesn't show up till after we leave. 
Thank God. But the preparation is on the way. On the way. And there, the orchestra is tuning up. And boy, someday the overture is going to start and you're going to be caught. Now, you want to say people sit at night with your Catholic or Protestant? There's going to come a time in your life. I warn you, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm the bigger joker you ever saw in your life, man. It comes having a good time, I'm for it. And people know me, I guess for a man my age, I guess I'm just about as worldly as I thought you ever met in your life. I enjoy living, man. I mean, just old fleshy, carnal living, man. <laughs> I enjoy shooting dove and shooting quail and fishing at night out in the bayou and playing racquetball and football and soccer. I enjoy that stuff. This good old carnal, fleshy stuff. But I'll tell you, when it comes to things like this, I wouldn't kid you and I wouldn't pull your leg and I wouldn't joke with you. Because one of these days, that baby's going to be calling, Mama, I'm hungry. Mama, I'm hungry. And Mama, you're not going to feed your baby unless you've got that mark there or got that mark there. And they're going to set you up with Bank America card and Visa and that thing down there at the grocery store to where you can't buy or sell unless you've got it. You know what I'd do if I were you? I would get saved and then get out of here. <laughs> That's what I'd do. I'd get saved and get out. Brother said to me one time, he said, well, Ruckman, you just want the Lord come because you're chicken. I said, amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. <laughs> I am chicken. I know what's coming, and brother, I don't want to be here when he shows up. I'm going to leave. Bye-bye. I'm going. Lord comes, moment, bring him by, I'm gone. Now, I'm just guessing now. I haven't guessed much there. That's all pretty straight. So I'm just guessing now. Maybe one of these days of night, let's suppose tonight. Suppose tonight saying about uh, three minutes would be good. Two minutes would be even better. <laughs> and about, suppose about now, bam, there's a light out there and that glass goes flying and you hear, da 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 I mean the sound of a trumpet. It probably dun 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 you know, or maybe da 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 Nothing like scientific progress. Hey, Darwin, nobody. <laughs> and that thing comes down there. Nothing like, nothing like college education, you dumb monkey man. And out of that door opens up like that, and a gorgeous figure steps out there. He might even be 13 feet tall, man. I mean, they were giants in the earth in those days. I mean, Superman got to show up. And he'll step out of there, that place, boy, and that mob in Rome, he got it out there, put in their beads and put in their flops and all kind of stuff. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, it's a vision of Mary, you know, hail fatty for team and all that bunch. And about that door up like that, and he'll step out of there and say, Peace be unto you. Behold, it is I myself, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see he has. And there's the spirit thrust right there, and there's the stigmata. I mean, every ten years they've got to come in and church, and their church professes to happen. They're the wounds right there. And that bunch of deluded, fanatical, papist idiots will say, I never had the right church! Ah! You know. <laughs> and about that time, he'll step down and say, we've removed these people of planet X, and you'll be the next to go. In the meantime, I've come back to bring peace on Earth from outer space. And the signs will say, I knew it! I knew it! There were people on the planet! I knew it! <laughs> And if that to say, I am the Christ and all the dumb, stupid Jehovah Witnesses and all the dumb, stupid Seventh-day Adventists and all you dumb, stupid Presbyterians, you dumb, God-defying, Bible-rejecting humanists that knew Christ was coming back but weren't saved will say, it's the Lord, he's come back. Then you'll be damned. The Bible said God will send them strong delusion. That Indian will take one look and say, good, now we get country back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And all those natives out there in Africa, New Guinea, they've been waiting for the gods to show up and say, that's him, I told you we were right. And the whole world will go after him. And he'll be the devil. I'll tell you, brethren, I thank God I have never seen Jesus Christ. 
Because if I had seen him, I could be fooled by a duplicate. But I can't be fooled by a duplicate because I've never seen it. Christ said, Blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. Oh, and that's a pretty good cue off the quid for one night. And let's, we're going to stand now and sing an invitation hymn. And I want to make myself clear in this invitation. I'm not saying all Catholics are lost. I'm not saying they're all going to hell. I'm not saying they're all damned. I'm not saying you've got to change your religion to be saved. Don't you misquote me. But I'm telling you this right now. If you're standing here tonight, and you're a man or a woman, or you're a boy or you're a girl, and you don't know that you're saved and have been to Calvary and are ready to leave, you better come tonight and get it fixed. Now, if you can like to help you, pastor's down here, pastor Mollick is down here, I feel the pastor's down here. Pastor Phillips, some of these folks have been here during the, the meeting, the personal workers here in this church, and the thing for you to do is don't go out that door until you know it's well with your soul. Good people, I, 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 I'll try to be reasonable with you. If you don't love Jesus Christ enough now among friends in a safe building to walk down the aisle and confess him, what will you do when your life depends upon it? Will you love him enough then to starve and let your kids starve? You don't have to starve now. You don't have to get your head cut off now. You'll get your head cut off then. You don't have to now. Now is accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Lead us in a hymn, will you, brother? 282. 282 in the hymnal. 282. How many of you men here tonight know how to lead a soul to Christ? Let me see your hand. You men. Hold your hand up high, please. High. Look okay, at a couple of hundred men here. Your man here tonight, there are 200 men here that'd be glad to show you how to be saved. You've got, you got friends. You've got friends. How many women know how to lead a soul to Christ? Let me see your hand. Women and girls, hold your hands up high. Uh, maybe 200 of them. See? You haven't got any problem. You hear where the Pope can't get you and the, <laughs> the Cardinal and the Mafia can't get you and the Casa Nostra. <laughs> they got a hit man out for you halfway to the service is over. <laughs> You're here in a place where people love you and want to see you saved. You come and trust Christ. Let me ask one more question. How many of you were Roman Catholic before you were saved? Let me see your hands. That's a third of the congregation. A third of the congregation. There are people here that have been along the road. You've been along. They know what to, to do to help you. All right, let's sing just as I am, brother. down here ready to meet you and kneel with you for a word of prayer and get the thing fixed. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Christ said, Whoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. I, mean, I thank God I've got, a, I've got a confessor before the throne. I've got a high priest up there. I don't have to fool around with some monkey in a Halloween costume. I can go right straight in the throne room. Down there where I live, I got an office back here in the church, and people have to knock at that door before they come in to see the secretary. My sons don't. I got three boys there in trouble. All I have to do is come to that door and come in and sit down. You know why? They're my sons. That's profound. You think about it. <laughs> I don't have to go through Mary, or Joseph, or blessed John the Baptist. I just walk into the throne room. Father, I need some help. Well, sit down, son. Tell me about it. Let Mary wait outside. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. Blessing just I am and waiting not. Now, don't you wait tonight. We're not going to tarry here much longer. You have a chance. Do something about it. Do something about it. How, how, many, how many of you converted Catholics were, were scared to go down the aisle the first time you heard the invitation? Let me see your hands. The hundreds here tonight. You're not in any unique company. The hundred have been right down the path you've been down. Uh, brother, I see Brother Saunders Ortiz back there came down to Pensacola and studied the Word of God. Boy, you think he didn't have time with his family? Santos Ortiz? You think they're Presbyterians? 
We had an old boy come down there, his name was Alberto Torres. <laughs> and he came down, he was a little meek fellow, almost effeminate. But that guy had a heart of a lion, man, he had a heart of a lion. That guy was about five feet six and just talked quiet. Well, Brother Ruffman, I went home and witnessed him, you know, almost, you know, you know, almost, you know. You know. <laughs> but he wasn't, he wasn't. And that guy witnessed all his Catholic family down in Mexico. They got mad at him. They cursed him. One night at a Christmas party, some of his brothers and cousins jumped on him, knocked him down, forced spear down his throat. Because they knew he didn't drink anymore. I mean, they persecuted that kid. And he stood up to him and never gave an inch. And he hadn't given an inch yet. Lord, going to bless that boy. Lord, bless you too. Come on. Come on. Come on. What are we saying? Just as I am and waiting on. Just as I am waiting on, come on, step out, step out, good, come on, some more of you tonight, come on and trust the Lord, come on, receive Christ, come ahead, O Lamb of God, I come, come on. You know why? You know why some of you Catholics are hard to reach? It's because you got so much truth without having the truth. If you're a good Catholic, you believe that Christ was virgin born. Amen. You're right. If you're a good Catholic, you believe in the Trinity, right? You're right. There is a Trinity. If you're a good Catholic, you believe Christ died for your sin, was buried, and rose from the dead, right? You're right. That's what makes Catholics so hard to win. They have so much truth, but they don't have the truth. You got a piece of bread instead of a savior. Eat that piece of bread on Sunday morning. How come you got to go back next Sunday and take it again? You know what happens to that bread after you eat it? Would you stand there and tell me that's what happens to Jesus Christ? You're deceived by the devil. You know what you ought to do tonight? You ought to come down here, and instead of receiving a wafer, you ought to receive God the Son. You say, well, I, I, I do it. Yeah, but you see, God is a spirit. You don't lay hold of a piece of stuff and put it in your mouth. You lay hold of Christ by faith. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. Aren't you sell tonight? I bet some of you Catholics been worried about it for years. I was going to the streets of Vienna one time about a year ago. If I could speak German, I, I'd come in sit over somebody else and I'd disappear in the bushes over there. So many lost people. I went to the Stock Park in Wien and I walked down and I saw people sitting on those benches out there just staring at the ground. Hours at a time. Nobody to talk to. Sometimes no newspaper, no magazine just sitting there staring like that. Third highest rate of suicide in Western Europe. I saw boys walking up and down that place at night, 12 o'clock at night, teenage boys, a hand in the pocket, up and down, up and down. No girlfriend, no boyfriend, no nothing. One night I and my wife were on the way to the Vienna Opera House to see an opera. It's amazing how God preaches, preaches us old bad attitude, hell raising street preaching back us. It's amazing what God does for us. You'd be surprised. I got started to preach. First time again to preach, a guy said, you better change the way you're preaching and be cutting down bush saplings for a bush arbor. No church will have you. <laughs> One night I was going down to the stock park and being the wife beside me, we just eating some roast pheasant, I think, a roast duck. We were going through that thing. I was dressed up in an Austrian dress suit that I bought over there, handmade in the Tyrol, and my wife alongside me, going down to the Vienna State Opera. We walked to the park, and I stopped in the middle of the park. I turned to my wife and said, I feel like a criminal. I just feel like a criminal. And she said, I know what you mean. I said, I've still got four of these cracks on me. We were saving them. We are trying to make them last. I'd given out 200 of them. I had four left, and we still had six days. And she said, if you give any way any more, we won't have enough to go back with. I said, no, but I said, I just can't stand it. I just can't stand it. I'm in good health. I got money. I got the new suit. I'm going to sit on opera. I've been eating roast pheasant. I got roast duck. I got more money to know what to do with them going to heaven when I die. And these people just dying over here and going to hell. I said, I can't stand it. And I took that crack and went back up across that place and walked over there and picked out a lady sitting out there about 70 years old, white gloves, nicely dressed, just sitting there staring at the ground. I sat down next to her, you know, and truly can see my Madonna. It's been on Americana, you know, and it's the stay in the Rhine, far as water, you know, that kind of thing, and get the 
Robin could do it with me or have patience with me. And I started him talking to that lady and gave her that track. You know what she said to me in German? She said, is this for me especially or do you give these to everybody? I said, lady, I pray for God to show me who to give it to. He told me to give it to you. And that woman looked me right in the face and said, well, I'm so glad I've been needing this. I've been wondering about my salvation for a long time. <laughs> Shake you up, man. Some of you Catholics stand here tonight, you're right in that sister's boots. You hope you're saved, you guess you're saved, you want to be saved, you're trying to receive, saved, you don't know. You'll never know till you quit trusting your religion and trust Jesus Christ. Blessing just as I am, I will receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Sing it. Come on, while we sing. This will be about the last stanza. Come on. We'll welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because I promise I believe. Come on, God help you. We're going to sing one more standing here in a minute, and then we're going to close. Over in Germany, how I go there? I go to South Germany. You might have known that. I said, that, you know, over in North Germany, they say the situation is serious, but not hopeless. And in the South Germany, they say the situation is hopeless, but not serious. <laughs> That's my bunch. And I got, I went down to Betches Garden down there, went up and hit the eagle's nest, got up there. I can see why I fell up there think he run the world. Boy, you get up there, you get feelings of grandeur looking out over that thing. <laughs> and I got walking around there up and down that place, and my gospel cracks on me, and I saw some old fellows off my right someplace, kind of white-headed, kind of gray-headed. I began to walk up down there and go... And pretty soon I looked those guys, looked back, and they looked all, you know, German tourists, looked back, looked on, and I went by there again, came pretty close to where they were, went by going. And pretty soon one of those fellows followed me off across the way and stopped me and said, uh, Good Morgan. I said, Good Morgan. We got a thing going there. He can speak with a broken English. And he said, uh, well, he said, those songs what you're singing. He said, where did you learn those? And we got talking. We talked about World War II and talked about Hitler and this and that. Got in close to them. They're both Fairmont. Both Fairmont. One about 65, one about 68. The older fellow couldn't speak a word of English. And I finished talking. I gave the guy that talked the broke English a title like it is in German and left him. We went on down the bottom of the mountain. And an hour later, he and his buddy came up and the man who was speaking English said to me in broken English, my friend has his feelings very hurt. I said, why? He said, you gave me one of these and didn't give him one. So I gave it. <laughs> Boy, they don't do that in the United States. And you know what that other German said to me in, in German? I couldn't get all of it. But I know what he said to me. Well, what the other fellow said later, you know what he said? He said, I'm going to take this track and take it back into East Germany where I'm from. I'm in the Russian zone of occupation. And there are hundreds of my people that would like to see this. And he said, if I'm caught with this, I'll be arrested, but I'm going to smuggle it in and I'm on the overcoat. And all they went. Place all South Germany just filled with Catholics. And over there in Egerlon, Czechoslovakia, German Catholics. And the west end of Poland, Pomerania, and Silesia, Polish Catholics. No salvation, no assurance, trust in a piece of bread. You folks in Rochester, you got the truth. You got people singing for you. You got people praying for you. What you waiting for? There are people over there starving for it and blowing the brains out. You got people that love you and praying for you and want to see you saved. Why don't you come? We'll sing one more stand. We're going to close. This is going to be it. God help you. Let's sing, brother. This is going to be it. You want to know you're saved? Come on, step out. Come receiving, come believing. Don't wait.
I've been talking to Roman Catholic folk for a lot of years. Led a lot of Roman Catholics to Christ. I know a little bit about what I'm talking about, just like Brother Ruckman did. My whole family is Polish Roman Catholic. Lost the same day. I was talking to a Roman Catholic man the other day. And I think his comment, well, epitomizes the majority of those folk in our community. I asked him, I said, why are you a Catholic? You know, if he thought about it, he wasn't a, a Roman Catholic because of the of any particular conviction. And he wasn't one because he'd studied his Bible and believed that that's what he ought to be as a result of studying his Bible. He said, well, I guess I was born into it. I said, yeah, but I haven't ever thought about it. And I guess his comment well characterizes a lot of folks that I've talked to over the years. He said, well, he said, I'm just going with the majority. Do you ever stop and think about the horrible danger of that? The majority of the religious crowd were responsible for crucifying Jesus Christ. That was the crowd, the majority that put your Savior on the cross. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you.